So, this experiment's about pulling together a few ideas that I've been working on and, and something that I've been thinking about for a while. And the idea is to grow carbon nanotubules out of amorph amorphous carbon. Now, um, iron acts as a catalyst for this, and if you have nanoparticulate iron and you heat it very hot, then you will grow nanotubules on that iron. It's usually done as a, a vapor deposition technique. Now, it occurred to me, well, why would you do it that way? Would it work in uh, water solution? So, if we got the nanoparticles of iron together and um, this amorphous iron together and stuck it in the microwave, then would we get growth of nanoparticles? Now, um, the amorphous iron I've, um, sorry, the amorphous carbon I've got is uh, non conductive, and carbon nanotubules would be conductive. So, conductivity would be a test of whether that's actually working or not. Uh, certainly, conductivity would be a test that something's working, and it would be nice to be able to do some microscopic examination of it. Again, that's beyond me, so I'm going to use conductivity as a kind of you know, benchmark that, yes, this has worked. Now, um, carbon nanoparticles, uh, sorry, iron nanoparticles are actually amazingly easy to form, and, and you need two things. Now, what I've got here is a solution of um, iron 3 chloride, ferric chloride. Uh, the reason I've got iron uh, 3 chloride is just that's what I had kicking around. You can use iron nitrate, uh, you can use iron sulfate, and I didn't think about using the sulfate, that's, that's the stuff we used as a fertilizer in a previous experiment. But I'm using iron chloride in this case. And great tea. Now, that is just green tea. It's, it's a, a, a cup of green tea that I've made up with a tea bag and, um, as you can see, a glass full of water. And what you do is pour the green tea into the iron solution, your iron salt solution. And what you should see happen is it goes black almost immediately. And despite spilling it everywhere, there we go. It's gone from that deep red colour to this black colour. Now what that actually means is that in there are our nanoparticles, and so we've made our iron nanoparticles pretty quickly. Um, the reason those are our nanoparticles and they stay in solution like that is that the um, porphyrins in the green tea reduce the iron uh, that's in the salt and act as a capping agent and keep it in solution. So what we've got is a solution of the finely dispersed iron nanoparticles in there. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is to make some amorphous carbon. Now there is um, an experiment, there's a school demonstration experiment of that that's pretty cool. If you take um, 50 grams of ordinary granulated sugar and add 20 milliliters of um, sulfuric acid, concentrated sulfuric acid, the sulfuric acid will dehydrate the sugar. Um, and what you get is the growth of something they call a black snake. It just grows upwards like that as an expanded amorphous carbon structure. And that's how we're going to make our amorphous carbon. So I'll get that together and be back in a second. Okay, so what we've got in the glass is about 50 grams of uh, ordinary table sugar. And to that you add 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid, or in my case, sulfuric acid drain cleaner. Now, it's an exothermic reaction. The sulfur sulfuric acid is a dehydrating agent. It sucks the water out of the sugar molecules, leaving just the carbon, and that's exothermic. And when you add water to sulfuric acid, it's exothermic again. So it's quite a hot reaction. That's why I'm standing on a tile. I don't want to burn my desk. Uh, and this will expand up out of there. And it's quite an impressive demonstration, actually. But it gives off carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. So you don't want to be sitting over it, breathing it in. I'm in a well ventilated room at the moment, uh, but really it's something you should be doing outside or in a fume cupboard. Uh, it takes a little bit to get going, but it's kind of spectacular. So I'll pour the uh, sulfuric acid on, step away, and leave it, and you'll see the reaction begin to start, and then when it starts, it really gets going. So.
so there you go. Once that reaction is finished, what you've got there, and that's quite warm, and what you've got there is a blob of acid impregnated amorphous carbon. What we're going to do with that now is wash it so that all of that acid that's in there is washed out. And you'll need to break it up into small, slightly smaller lumps and wash out the acid. So what I did after that was break it up into lumps, give it a good old wash to get rid of most of the acid, and then I put the lumps into a ball mill. Now I'm quite lucky because I have a ball mill, but they're relatively simple things to make, and if you want some instructions on how to make one, then I'm quite happy to make one if enough people ask. But I put it into a ball mill and ground it down with some water into this thick, oily, black liquid. And that is my suspension of um, yeah. That's it. It is, in fact, nanoparticulate. Um, it is my suspension of nanoparticulate amorphous carbon. Carbon. The reason I know it's nanoparticulate is uh, it's not particularly hydrophilic, and that's about two days old now. I made this one earlier, could be good and good blue Peter fashion. So it's been standing around for a couple of days and it's still in suspension. So we have our two solutions. We have our solution of zero galatin and our solution of amorphous carbon. So what we're going to do now is add those two together in a 50-50 mix and heat them in a microwave for 10 minutes. Now I've tested this for electroconductivity and it's zero. Uh, I mean the resistance on it is huge. My meter goes up to uh, 200 mega ohms and it's still reading infinite resistance. So it's certainly greater than that. So I'm going to um, do that for 10 minutes and then see what kind of resistance we get. So I had some um, interesting results from that experiment. I put it into a test tube with a, a rubber bung in it and heated it for about five minutes, I think. And um, the pressure just blew the bung out. I, I put a cap of plastic on the bung and held it on with a rubber band, but the pressure in there was just too much for it and it blew it out. But it did leave a tiny little bit of fluid in there. So I cut that little bit of fluid on some paper and it went from a black to a kind of um, reddish brown. I don't know if you can see that very well here actually. That's better, there you go, a kind of reddish brown. So that black solution went to this reddish brown colour. And the most interesting thing about it is that it actually changed to um, conductive. So going from a non-conductive, it suddenly became conductive, which I thought is really quite cool. So obviously something's happened there. Now originally the metal and the iron nanoparticles were coated in polyphenols and the polyphenols um, although the capit stop the particles getting in close enough contact for them to um, conduct between each other. So what I strongly suspect is in that short time um, the polyphenols have been replaced by a capping of carbon and now those particles are actually in much closer contact and they've got a conductive contact between them. So although it's not very conductive because it's not, a, not as strong and it's not happened particularly well, that I think that something definitely interesting has happened there. Now, um, I was reading another paper that was talking about localised heating. It was saying you've got a problem with these things because, you know, the temperature required to do this sort of stuff is so high. What you should try is a um, thin film of a conductive material, and there's a local heating effect on that thin film of conductive material. Now, I have um, a bit of this kicking around. And this is from an old television. It's got a non-conductive sticky side, and then it's got a thin film of indium tin oxide on that. And I've got quite a big sheet of it, so um, I basically tore off a bit of it. And if we look at the sticky side, then we get absolutely nothing. And if we flip it over onto the conductive side, there you go. This is what you'd expect, because it's um, indium tin oxide. So I filled, uh, well, I put some of this uh, iron nanoparticles and carbon mix into uh, a beaker and I popped that in for 10 minutes. That lasted about 7 minutes and what came out was this which looks like a, a carbon bit of film. Now you can just feel that that's the sticky side and you can just feel that that's the indium tin oxide side. So if I put the contacts on the indium tin oxide side there you go, it's got the same conductivity, which is what you'd expect. But the interesting thing is that if I then put the contacts on the sticky side, it's yeah. quite reasonable conductivity on the side that previously had no conductivity at all. So again, something has happened on there. That sticky side has become coated with um, what I think are carbon nanotubules. Um, the iron has been attracted to the... Um, 
sticky part here and the carbon, because of the localised heating effect, the carbon has grown from those. Now it's such a short time at such a low temperature, we're not getting a good result on it, but it's certainly extremely interesting what's happened there. So what I think is the next thing to do, really, is um, to get myself something that can stand up to the pressure. Now I'm not quite sure what, so what I thought I'd do is show you where I've got to, and um, I think I can claim that I've made carbon nanotubules at home, of course, it would have been nice to have a bucket load of them, but I still think something's happened there of great interest, uh, and it's worth pursuing. So that's what I'm going to do. Or if any of you guys fancy making carbon nanotubules in a microwave, give it a go and let me know. Still, although I don't feel I've finished with this, I thought I'd better report it to you because, boy, is it interesting.